Um, hello, everybody. I think I'm live. Who knows? Who knows if I'm really live? <clears throat> After uh, months and months of lockdown, it's pretty much difficult to tell whether any of us is really alive or not. Um, I've done the thing where you have your desk and your books in the background and it all looks really cool. But in fact, I'm um, living in a practically a shack on the beach um, that I share with a friend of mine. And I've been here since February uh, and we don't have a desk here. So um, you can see I'm actually sitting on the floor. Can you see? Sort of. Uh, there's a chair at my level. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so things are not what they seem. Oh, people are saying hello already. Hello, hello. But look, I haven't actually uh, said the important things, which is I'm Meg Rosoff, which you probably know. And I'm going to talk about the, good, the Great Garden today. And I want to start by giving huge thanks to the the four indies for inviting me to come talk about my book today um as part of their celebrations for independent bookshop week and of course they are uh book up bookish forum books and lingams and we all know at the moment that we have to support our independent bookshops because uh they're all <laughs> under lockdown as well. And I've been ordering books like mad because I have tons of time to read because uh, I'm not running around doing, I mean, what did we do? I can't even remember what I used to do. Um, so yeah, hello everybody. Hello, um, ooh, Tracy Dunbar and Y and Mary Suler from Rochester, Minnesota. Oh my God, Minnesota. Well, you guys have sort of been in the news a little bit lately. And hello, Carrie from Book a Bookshop. How nice. And Mark White. And I'm going to stop saying hello to everybody who writes to me just in case uh, millions of people do. Um, uh, how do we start? How do we start? I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with the Great Garden. Whoops, that way. Yeah. Left, right, something. Yeah. Hope my daughter isn't watching because she thinks I'm a moron when it comes to this kind of stuff. There you go. Look. Hmm. Um, oh, and there's foreign books. Hiya. Um, I'm actually staring straight out. You can't see it, uh, but I'm staring straight out at here. I'm going to put it here so you don't forget. Um, at the beach on which I set the the um, the great garden. Uh, it's set. Uh, on the place that I have this house that I share with my friend in East Anglia, but it's also set in my head um, from a time in my childhood when my family used to go to the beach every summer. Um, I grew up in Boston and there was a little island off Cape Cod and it's now very trendy, but it wasn't at all trendy in those days. Um, and the opening scene where the family of four kids and, and the two parents cram all their stuff into the car and head off for the beach is um, pretty much what my childhood was like. Uh, we went to a little house. It was always full of sand and um, uh, the chairs were all always kind of falling apart and there were ants everywhere and um, we, but we loved it. We were, we were really free and it was the memory of that uh, phase of my childhood combined with this kind of phase of my adulthood that um, brought the great garden to life. Oh, my dog is here and I'm sitting, I'm blocking his bed. Here, sweetheart. <laughs> Sorry about this. This is, this is what's called real life, real live action. No, it wasn't Nantucket, Mary. It was Martha's Vineyard. But if I say Martha's Vineyard now, people think, oh, you were, you know, just this incredibly posh rich kid. But uh, Martha's Vineyard back in the 60s was just a kind of backwater of a um, of a little island. And uh, because it was an island, we could hitchhike all over the place. Um, and our parents didn't worry about us. And because it was the 60s and 70s, our parents didn't worry about us because they hadn't invented helicopter parents yet, I think. Um, anyway... I can't show you the beach because it gets blown out if I try to um, 
turn the computer around. But you have to take my word for it. I had a fabulous swim earlier today. Uh, it's the North Sea, so it's a little bit cold. Um, the way the Great Garden came about is kind of a bit odd. And it was sort of so long ago that even I've almost forgotten about it. Um, in 2011, I went to a book festival in Norfolk and it was one of those really kind of shambolic, chaotic, but absolutely fantastic um, festivals. And the guy who was running it came around at the last minute and he said, look, we're running a charity auction and I can't remember who it was for, but would you donate a character in one of your books? And I said, yeah, sure. And I don't know if you guys have, have heard about this, um, <clears throat> but it's something that authors sometimes do. And for instance, Anthony Horowitz donated um, a, uh, the Bond heroine in his latest Bond book, I think, and somebody paid 46,000 pounds for it. And then it turned out she had a name like, oh, it's a really unsexy name, like, um, you know, uh, God, Muriel Pike or something. Anyway, she didn't sound like a, a Bond heroine and he said he had to translate it into French before it worked. Um, anyway, this woman didn't pay anything like 40,000 pounds, but she bought a character and her last name was Garden. And I just felt guiltier and guiltier because I wasn't really writing the book. And normally I sort of wait for inspiration, you know, for a, a, a line or a, um, a thought to kind of come to me in the night. Um, and then I start writing and it just wasn't happening with this one. I kind of didn't know what I was going to write about. And I was in a sort of longer and nothing was, was going on in my head. And I said to myself, Meg, for God's sakes, you're a writer, just sit down and start writing the book. So I started writing the book and, um, it was sort of dead as a dodo from the very beginning. It, it didn't want to come alive. Now, I was telling my daughter this story and she said, but mom, uh, all your books are dead as a dodo until the kind of last minute when they all come together. And I think it's always worth saying that in case there are any writers listening, because it is a weird process writing a book. And I don't know if everyone does it the same way, but for me, the book is just, just feels kind of almost like a dead thing most of the time until the last minute where I just pull the last four or 5,000 words out of it. And um, I've been known to even add an extra character at the last minute. Um, and then suddenly it just all comes together and it's really tight, like putting a Rubik, you know, like playing around endlessly with a Rubik's cube. And then suddenly it just, everything lines up. But it didn't happen with this book and it, um, it went on and on and I just thought this is never going to be right. This book is just dead and I was trying to fabricate it out of nothing. I didn't have the great idea and so I'm just going to leave it. And when, when people asked me, you know, do you have any books in your bottom drawer that you, you know, you're keeping for a rainy day? I said, well, there's only one that I didn't finish. Uh, and I probably never will finish it. Um, but then about a year and a half ago, uh, I went into that virtual uh, bottom drawer and um, I had a, a look and I thought, oh yes, I forgot about this book. And I started to read the last draft and I thought, God, this really went wrong. You know, it, it, it's just, it's not right at all. Uh, you know, the narrator is I just just totally out of focus, and maybe that's why I abandoned it. Then I went back another draft, and it was terrible. And then I went back a third draft, and I could sort of see where it had started to go wrong. Um, and I went back a fourth draft, um, and I just randomly keep drafts. You know, maybe every couple of weeks when I'm working on a book, I'll just save it as a draft with a date on it. And I went back four drafts, and I thought. Ah, now this is before it started to go horribly wrong. And actually I can see that there's something in this. Um, so I went back to it and I started to rewrite it. Now, one of the things that I realized when I went back to it was there was a huge problem with the narrator. The narrator wouldn't decide. And that sounds, that always sounds so kind of pretentious, you know, like you're the writer, you tell the 
tell the narrator who he or she is. You know, you, you don't wait for the narrator to tell you. But there are cases, and almost all writers will tell you this, where either a plot element or a, a character or something refuses to fall into line and just disrupts the whole structure of the book. Um, and that was the case here. And I realized I'd been switching back and forth from having a female um, narrator to having a male narrator. And I couldn't come up with a name that worked. And when I went back to it eight years later, I thought, okay, maybe the book is trying to tell me something. And so not to kind of give anything really important away, but if you read the book, you'll see that you have to make up your own mind um, of the sex and gender and and name really of the of the narrator in in this book and uh and and it felt happier and i was able to finish it once i'd made that decision not to push it into a um uh you know into a square peg into a round hole um so that's kind of how it how it came about. I mean, it's I'm very very bad at plot, and I tell people that all the time. I mean, uh, it's probably what stopped me from being a writer. Um, I didn't write my first novel till I was about forty five, and uh, I probably secretly always wanted to be a writer. And in practical terms, I was a writer. I mean, I I probably wrote 10,000 letters, you know, back before the internet. Um, I used to stay late at work when I was in my 20s because I had no social life to speak of in New York City. And I used to just type out letters on my electric typewriter, you know, till midnight. And I was always sort of reframing my somewhat miserable uh, life in New York. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time, but that is sort of an apprenticeship. Um, uh, for being a writer. Hello, Sarah Jeremiah. Uh, yeah, keeping the drafts. I see Tracy Dunbar said keeping the drafts. Um, you got to keep the drafts just in case you do go horribly wrong. You might want to come back sometime. Um, I have, I have kept big chunks and chapters that I've cut out of a book into a separate file, but I never go back to them. You know, once it's gone, it, you know, it's I never want to have it back again so that's kind of I don't know writer's method everybody has a different method um so so where was I yes oh right so I'm terrible at plot and I noticed that that most of my books fall into one of two categories which is the app the two basic plot categories that um film people usually talk about and they they say that there are only really uh, two um, plots in the whole world. And one of them is uh, The Journey, and the other one is A Stranger Comes to Town. So, for instance, my book, How I Live Now, uh, was a combination of A Stranger Comes to Town, Daisy Comes from Manhattan, and then Goes on a Journey. So, um, I occasionally somebody says, what a fantastic plot. They've sort of been saying, uh somebody was asking me about the plot in The Great Garden and saying it's really tight and it's really, ooh, it's, you know, really well plotted and really intricately plotted. And I was so thrilled about that because um, I always figure my plots are completely haphazard and they sort of come, you know, as I'm, as I'm writing. But, but this one is, is, is pretty simple and, and unfortunately has nothing to do with my life on the beach. Um, and it's basically, uh, a, a family with four children, which we did have, um, and another couple who are sort of related to the family. And the um, the godmother of the couple who are in their 30s uh, is a Hollywood uh, sort of slightly faded movie stars, um, movie star. Um, and she, for reasons that we don't really know, has decided to drop her two sons well she's going off to shoot a film and and she's decided to drop her two sons on the beach sort of to spend the summer with these two families so it's perfect stranger comes to town territory we've got two movie stars kids from LA two boys one is very very beautiful one is kind of dark and nobody really likes him 
Um, and we've got teenage girls and boys and all sorts of things running around the beach. And I think anybody who's ever had a holiday uh, at the beach will know that the, the great thing about it is the, the freedom because it's, you know, you can send your kids out onto the beach. It's not like saying go play in traffic or, um, you know, go to the mall or, or something like that. There, there, there is a kind of freedom. And, and when we were kids, no one ever knew where we were. So I sort of used all that stuff to make the comings and goings in this book. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sexual comings and goings. There's a lot of emotional comings and goings. Um, uh, anyway. Well, who knows? Maybe it's good. Well, I always hope it is good. Anyway, I did send it to my, I sent it to my agent, and she had no idea that I was, I was working on this book, and I hadn't told her that I'd written this book and thrown it away eight years earlier. Um, so she was really shocked when I sent it to her, and I sent it with an email that said, uh, "Dear Catherine, is this a book? I can't even tell." And she wrote back, and she said, "Yes, I, I, I think it is a book." Um, and it has turned out to be one. So, so that's the great garden. Um, and garden is the name of, I think, did I say that already? The name of the person who uh, bought the name of the book, but she, I then sent it to her and she said, um, uh, I don't really want you to name the character after me anymore because I, my career has come on and I'm probably too well known now. And, uh, and by the way, can you change the name I said, that's fine. I'll change the first name. You won't be recognizable. And she said, well, can you change the second name as well? Um, and I just wrote a little email back going, oh, sorry, no, because I'd already made it the title. So there you go. Um, how I how I write books, uh, it might just be worth going into a little bit because they're, they're all pretty much the same. And uh, when I talk to people about writing, you know, I, there's so many misconceptions on, on how a book is written. You know, there isn't a right way to, to write a book. Um, I was watching a, um, oh, uh, who was it? I was watching another one of the, the talks earlier today just to get an idea of how it works. And the writer was saying, well, I don't understand how you can start with you know, you write a, a whole draft and then go back and change the chapters and change the characters. But that's exactly what I do. Um, I Because I'm so bad at plot, I want to just get an arc down on paper. I want to get to the end. Um, and once I get to the end and sort of vaguely know how it's going to end, then I then I know I have a book. Um, in the past, I've, I've sent those first drafts off to editors and they you can see them panicking. I mean, they, they, they just, you know, I can see them calling up my agent and so, sort of saying, what is this? You know, we thought Meg was a good writer, but this is, this is nonsense. It makes no sense at all. And, and the characters are terrible and it's, yeah. And I used to get really cross and say, did you explain to them that that it's just an, I, you know, you're just supposed to see ahead to the glorious book it will be. Um, and my agent said, yes, I, I did try to do that, but it, somehow didn't really work. Um, so I've stopped sending first drafts to editors because they just don't understand. Um, but what I what I generally do is just start in a place. So in this case, I start with an idea, the, these two boys coming to the beach. Um, and and then I, I'm sort of creeping behind the characters. You know, I'm, I'm following them as they arrive, I'm thinking, okay, so what would happen when they arrive? You know, what would their arrival be like? How would everybody react to them? You know, what might happen next? And I'll get to the end and then I'll go back and look again and think, mm, no, that doesn't ring true, that bit there. Um, and by the time you get to the, to the end of writing a book, you think this is such a beautiful polished gem and God, I'm a good writer. And wow, you know, it was so easy, but it just so happens that in this case, with The Great Garden, um, having the book come out has coincided with me trying to finish a first draft of another book. And I very rashly um, uh, promised my editor that I would do three books, each set over a single summer, because I thought that's great. For somebody who's not very good at plot, uh, a book set over a single summer is, is 
is wonderful because it's a, it's time limited. There's a nice arc in a summer. You know, you go with great excitement and expectation. The, you know, the summer goes on, and then at the end, there's a denouement, and and it's over. And it's only six weeks long, or in America, ten weeks long. Um, so the next one is set in New York City in in the early '80s with uh, a girl who's gone to work at a newspaper in a very, very hot summer. And it's a shambles. I mean, I can tell you now, it doesn't even have a title, but it, it's it's just a shambles of a book. And, you know, I, I, I think, oh, why did I ever start this? What well, made me think writing about New York was a good idea. You know, I, I, I haven't lived there for 30 years. I barely remember it. But then, you know, I kind of go back and I think, yeah, I get to this stage with every single book where I'm standing over the the bin with the manuscript. You know, it's all digital. So, you know, I have to stand over the bin with my laptop um, and threaten to, to drop it in and just abandon it. And I never was a writer. And what made me think I should start this business anyway? Um, I... I've also, since lockdown, been been working on a screenplay for my last book, um, which was a so-called adult book, but frankly, I don't see that it's really any different at all from, um, uh, you know, all the books I've written in the past. The guy was in his early 20s, but, you know, I'm, what I'm interested in is the transition from teen to um, uh, adulthood, which, in my mind, goes from about the age of 14 until you know, pretty much a few minutes before you get declared dead uh, at the age of 96. You know, I think that that whole process of, you know, trying to figure out who you are and what you should do with your life doesn't happen in four years. You know, for me, look at me, I didn't even write a book till I was 45, 46. Um, and and I, I love it now because my daughter's at an age where all her friends are trying to figure out what to do with their lives and all their parents are saying, oh, I wish they would just decide. And, um, and I keep saying, look, I was the slowest developer in the world. I didn't figure out what I wanted to do until I was in my 40s, so leave your kids alone. You know, they'll probably all end up as drug addicts on the street or something and they'll blame me, but anyway, we, we've got time for that. Um, uh, but anyway, so I've been working on the screenplay for Jonathan Unleashed, and there's a very, very good producer, very experienced, and I keep sending him drafts, um, and he keeps sending them back saying, uh, no, and he doesn't say, well, good job, you know, I, I think you've really come on on this one, you know, you've really brought the story on in a really interesting way. He just goes, nope, it's really quite disheartening. Um, and I've been doing that for four years. I've been sending him drafts and he's been waiting a month or so and just writes back, no. Occasionally a nice, interesting comment, but I got up to um, to Suffolk and the first thing I did on lockdown was I said, right, I'm gonna do one last draft of this bloody screenplay, it's ruining my life. And if he doesn't like this one, uh, which he won't, um, I'm gonna stop because four years is enough time. And I said, and I'm going to do all the things he doesn't want me to do. I'm going to take the plot out because there's too much bloody plot in it. And I'm going to, you know, really pare it way down. And anyway, I did all those things and I sent it off and he wrote back and said, look, you know, this pandemic is doing my head in. I can't even read a script now and I'll get back to you when I've read it. And sort of nine weeks later, I'd completely forgotten about it. Um, and he wrote back and he said, um, yeah, you got it finally. Um, and, uh, I couldn't believe it. I thought maybe he was deluded or drunk or something, but anyway, he seemed to like it. Anyway, just this morning I wrote to him and I said, so what's happening with our film? You know, have you got all my, my suggestions of directors, you know, all the ones who recently won Academy Awards and things like that. Uh, and he said, no, the movie business has collapsed and I can't get funding for the the films I've got casts for already. Uh, and besides your suggestions for directors are idiotic. Um, oh, Marilyn, hello. <laughs> Marilyn, wonderful, wonderful independent bookshop. Oh, yes. Shout out to the Norfolk Children's Bookshop. Is that what it is? Norfolk, Norfolk Children's, yeah, something like that. Anyway, 
Everybody run to Norfolk and buy your books there if you're not buying from the four who are sponsoring me here today. Anyway, let's stop that. Um, so yeah, so someday I might have a um, another film. But I do kind of tell stories like this just so people don't think that writing is all about hanging around in your pajamas all day and having a good time, which it kind of is. But um, uh, it, the uncertainty and the the self-doubt and the exhaustion and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not as hard as working in a chicken factory, but, you know, there are times where I think, what made me think I can do this? You know, I, I, I've i written, I mean, I've, Great Gun is my ninth novel. Um, and um, my husband said to me the other day, I think nine novels is probably enough, <laughs> which is great. Because uh, he's a painter and somebody's got to make a living. Um, Anyway, yes, Susie Bevan would love to see your books as films. I would love to see more of my books as films. Um, How I Live Now had an amazing, amazing cast with Saoirse Ronan and um, George Mackay and Tom Holland. I, I wasn't 100% sure about the film, um, but I know a lot of people have really liked it. And anyway, you should never ask a writer if they like the film you've made of their book because they're always going to say, you destroyed my vision. So, um... I'm going to do a little sampler that says you've destroyed my vision and give it to my producer when he finally does make the film of um, um, uh, what's but the, what's the book called? I don't know. Jonathan Unleashed. Um, now, let's see. Uh, 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 Carrie says, I love your honesty. You got to be honest. I mean, there's no point. You know what? I do think one thing that helps with with honesty is the fact that I was so old when I did finally write a book. So when I took a, a horse riding again at the age of 48, somebody said to me, whatever you do, don't ever take lessons from somebody who's been riding since they were two years old because they don't know how they do it. Um, and I think it's kind of the same with writing books. You know, somebody who says, oh, I've been a writer since the age of, of four, doesn't even know how they write a book. Whereas I actually had to email my agent um, and say, how long is a book supposed to be? And, you know, I emailed the only person I knew in the world who, who had written a novel and said, so how do you do it? And she said, well, you make uh, a list of all your characters and then you write a little bit of backstory for each of them. And then, you kind of outline your plot and then you kind of do it chapter by chapter and you sort of say what's going to happen in each chapter. And I was sort of taking notes and listening to all this. And of course, I don't write anything like that. Um, uh, I, Jonathan Unleashed, I woke up one morning having had a dream in which the line, uh, Jonathan came home from work one day to find the dogs talking about him. Uh, stuck in my head and I didn't even have to write it down. I knew it was the beginning of a book, but I didn't know who Jonathan was and I didn't know who the dogs were and I didn't know why they were talking about him. But um, there's, a, there, there's a kind of magic. Um, you know, people are always asking what's the best thing about being a writer. And for me, the best thing about being a writer is that you get to think, you know, my job now is not to write stupid advertising copy for idiotic um, products that nobody wants, which is what I did for 15 years working in advertising. Um, and it's, you know, it's not working for a newspaper who you don't really like or, you know, all the kind of jobs that you feel you're compromising. My job is to think. And, and the weird thing about that is that you're, brain takes, you know, it's like a, a London taxi driver. There are parts of your brain that actually work in slightly different ways to people who are running around too much to think all the time, which is why I'm slightly convinced that lockdown might actually not be such a bad thing for a lot of people. You know, you obviously, it's terrible for a lot of people, but the enforced time to think is something that none of us really is used to unless we're writers. Um, oh, Tony, well, what was the worst thing I had to sell? Oh, I mean, I, I, you know, where do you start? 
I do remember there were these little, um, uh, they, they were like little, little tiny uh, sort of rectangular things that you put on your tongue. They were like breath mints, but they weren't mints. They were just little strips. And, you know, how on earth do you advertise something like that? It was, I remember we were trying, they, oh, the, the brief was, it's like having a party in your mouth. But, you know, who wants to have a party? <laughs> Let's have a party in your mouth. I mean, uh, anyway, I did a very good campaign for Hush Puppies, one for uh, Ford Fiesta that I was very proud of, but basically it was a whole waste of a life. Um, but I, I, I did learn a lot. Um, and that's another great thing about being a writer is that every crappy, awful thing that's ever happened to you in your life um, becomes material. And so when I was 50, it was just around my 50th birthday, I flew out with my 10 year old daughter to California to see my mother. And she and I, who, I mean, we had a, we had a quite good relationship in lots of ways, but she, she was always telling me that my haircut was wrong and my clothes were terrible. And, you know, and I used to say, mom, Look, if they are terrible, it's too late. I'm 50 now. But anyway, we had a massive, massive fight that made me feel sick for days. It was so awful. And I was thinking afterwards, okay, well, at least I'll be able to use that someday. That absolutely devastating feeling that you have when you've said things you wish you hadn't said and you felt things that are just, you know, why am I still arguing with my mother at the age of 50? Um, so. So all those things um, kind of collect and, and they show up, you know, in, in books. I'm trying to think of an example in, in The Great Garden. Um, well, I did, and, and I've written a little bit about it. I did have a terrible, terrible boyfriend um, in my teens who, he, I, I really liked him. And in fact, he, he stayed in my life for years, but he was, a complete nightmare. I never had his phone number. I mean, eight years, you know, he would come visit me maybe once a year, twice a year. When we were a bit younger, it was a little bit more often. He would just show up and he never gave me any notice. And sometimes I wasn't there and he'd leave a note and I'd be devastated. Um, and we once went off swimming at the beach at night, you know, the most romantic thing in the whole world, which features in, in the great garden. And, um, we were, we were lying on the beach after swimming, staring up at the sky. And I didn't know anything about the Perseid, um, uh, meteor showers in those days. But as we lay there, we suddenly saw a sky full of shooting stars. Now, it's a phenomenon that happens every year and not only every year, but you know, three times a year or, or something like that, but it felt like magic. And it, it felt like the most romantic magic in the entire world. Now he was the wrong person <laughs> and, you know, but it didn't matter. I, I was mad about him. Um, and those are the things that sort of stick in your head and, and even 40 years later uh, will sort of eke their way out of your brain and, and into a book. Um, right, Susie, well, you're asking me, were you worried about putting the fir lovely first sexual experience in how I live now? Or did it just have to be? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, am I worried writing about teenagers and sex? I mean. I will come clean here and say that I was certainly not having sex when I was 14 or 15. I mean, I was from a, a you know, very tr traditional family. I didn't even think about having sex until I went to university. Um, but uh, I'm interested in all those emotions and I'm interested in, you know, what it feels like to be in love for the first time, uh, you know, whether it works or it doesn't work. Um, and I never, ever, ever think, oh, I can't put this in a book. Um, you know, my books are published for young adults, or supposedly, but I'm not thinking too much about my audience when I'm writing. I'm thinking about what I'm interested in. And when I go back to 
my university days and even before, um, the books that I was really interested in were were coming of age books and really classic coming of age books. So things like Henry the Fourth, you know, Shakespeare. Um, you know, when Prince Hal is friends with um, Falstaff and uh, uh, his father is very upset about it and says, you know, you've got to leave these wastrels alone. You're going to be king someday. Um, you know, th that is coming of age, but it's coming of age in a in a pretty classic way. Um, books like The Age of Innocence. Um, uh, I mean, the when I look back, there are just so many of them that um, only in retrospect did I realize how much that transition right. from being a child to being an adult um, was completely compelling to me. So I'm writing about this subject of leaving childhood behind Wordsworth. I mean, I studied Wordsworth at university. I find him a bit a little bit hard to take now, but, you know, I was completely obsessed with that idea of, um, you know, the, the lost paradise, the lost paradise of, of childhood. When my mother told me, you know, everyone, every girl gets the conversation, although my daughter didn't get it. She knew more about it than I did, uh, you know, when they're 10 or 11, about womanhood. My mother gave me a book called Way to Womanhood. Um, and the thing I most remember in it was something about masturbation causing insanity. So I don't know where she got the book, but probably from a kind of 18th century library. Um, but, um, sorry, I got distracted there. Uh, yes, so when she told me about, you know, someday you will become a woman and you will have periods and you'll, you know, have babies and you will meet Mr. Wright and all that. And I cried for a week. I mean, I just was not into this whole idea of being a woman. Um, you know, I've, I've just about managed it over the years, but it's been touch and go a lot of the time. Um, but I think a lot of people have that experience. You know, um, it's it's much more out in the open now than it used to be. Uh, and people don't worry about being the right sort of girl or the right sort of boy, uh, which is something else I've written about. Um, in fact, somebody was asking me recently about um, the book, What I Was which I wrote in 2007. And I remember when that book came out and that was about a um, uh, a boy at boarding school in the 60s who falls in love with a boy who lives by himself, you know, in a hut on the beach. And, and I was really interested in that book and exploring the whole idea of gender. And, you know, what does it mean to be the perfect boy? What does it mean to be a failure as a boy? Um, and I was invited to, Talk, go talk about the book at the Gay Men's Book Club in London. And the Gay Men's Book Club, I knew nothing about it, but apparently it's a very prestigious and, um, you know, uh, uh, exclusive kind of book club and, you know, lots of very intellectual, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was all gay men. Um, and they, uh, they really attacked me because uh, that well, the book ends up with a, the, the, well, I, you know, I can't, it's not, it's not a purely, it's more a kind of, I don't know, in this day and age, it would be called more a, a transgender uh, love affair or a gender peculiar queer um, love affair. And they shouted at me for it not being gay enough, you know, they, because it didn't end happily ever after with two men, you know, deeply in love. But that's not what I was writing about. It's not what I was interested in. And in the great garden, you know, writing about first love and first sex, I mean, it so often goes so horribly wrong. Um, and I, I, you know, I wonder how much people do explore that. Um, you know, I, I find in my life that uh, it, it's something I've tried to figure out for years and years. Why do you, why do you stand, you know, why do people say, oh, I walked into the party, I saw him or her or it across the room, and I thought, I knew at that moment we were going to be together forever. And sometimes it happens. Well, how do you know? You know, what is it that, that makes you fall in love with one person and not another? You know, I'm sure there are things that we don't know about, like the smell of a person or, you know, elements that 
that we have absolutely no idea about. But um, I'm looking at myself on this thing and I'm thinking, God, I need a haircut. But I think we all need haircuts, don't we? Anyway, you can tell I haven't been cheating by getting my hair cutter flown in. Right, so we've got another question here from Susie. Did your editor or publisher try and influence such themes? I've been really, really lucky because How I Live Now was my first novel and it was so successful, people have left me alone. Now, I, I haven't written a book since How I Live Now that sold as well. Um, as, uh, you know, that sold millions of copies around the world. Um, but in a way, it was a really good way to, to start because it means that people don't bug me. I mean, there, there's a line in The Great Garden where one of the brothers says of the other one, my brother is such a C word. And my editor very, very gently sent me an email and said, could we change this to something else? And I knew she would do that. Uh, I was just trying to wind her up really. And it's usually it's not necessary to do that kind of thing. And, you know, people have written about absolutely everything for teenagers. I think teenagers probably know more than we do about, you know, so-called taboo subjects. Um, so no, nobody really does um, try to influence me very much, which is very nice, except that every once in a while, well, I don't know, every once in a while I wish somebody else would write my books for me. Um, uh, you know, it does it does bring up the subject of, of YA and, and what what makes a YA book. You know, it's a completely artificial category in a way. Um, my favorite book of all time is, is a book called um, A High Wind in Jamaica. And uh, if anybody out there is 14, I'm telling you, do not read this book. But it used to be given to every 14 year old boy in boarding school in England because it was a book about pirates. And if you ask 14 year old boys, people who were 14 year old boys, you know, back in the 60s or 70s, if they've read High Wind in Jamaica, they go, oh yeah, it was a great book, it was about pirates. And I say, no, no, it was not about pirates. <laughs> but they think it was about pirates. And I, I don't think he wrote it, it's a guy called Richard, R Richard Hughes. It was written in 1929. And, you know, it's about, oh my God, what is it about? It's about, I mean, if you haven't read it, everybody out there, all you wonderful readers and book people, um, well, read my book first, but then read A High Wind in Jamaica. Um, it's about, um, I mean, underage sex and, I mean, also all themes that, you know, if you were a kid in a boarding school, you would have just missed. Um, uh, you know, same with things like Catcher in the Rye and, um, uh, what's the one about the boys on the island? Come on, somebody, could somebody write that one in? Oh, uh, Lord of the Flies, thank you, got it. Um, you know, they, they were written about children, but they're not really written for children. Um, so every once in a while I give in and I, out of a morbid, terrible curiosity, I go on Goodreads, um, which is always a mistake. One should never do that. Um, and people say things like, uh, Meg Rosoff is such a boring writer. She uses really short sentences and hardly any words. <laughs> I want to go, I want to write back to them, you know. It's really hard to write that way. <laughs> but I don't, because my daughter threatens me never to engage. Um, let's see, let's see. What else can we talk about here? Um, uh, da, 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 darkness. Well, darkness, yeah. Uh, y you know, I say to people, people when I teach creative writing that the the question that writers hate the most is was this book autobiographical because it sort of suggests that you don't have enough imagination um to write a real book you know a real book where you make everything up but in a sense everything you write is autobiographical because or autobiographical because where does it come from it comes from your head you know what's in your head the only thing in your head is stuff that you've experienced and read and um fantasized about and you know imagined and and so although the facts may not be autobiographical the 
the feeling of it um, is autobiographical. Oh, God, what was I talking about? Does anyone remember? Um, oh, darkness. Yes, dark themes. So my... <laughs> My brain is pretty dark, and you know, if you if you ever go into therapy, which I did, um, they, you know, one of the questions they always ask is, "So, what was your first memory?" You know, and my first memory was a nightmare when I was about two and a half years old about a huge, scary gorilla taking my sister away, and I know I was really young because she was still in nappies, diapers, um, and they were bloody, and it, oh, it was just so awful. So I think I've always been a pretty dark person and I don't know how you get that way whether you're born that way or um yeah I think you must be born that way but my favorite favorite sort of books are uh books that are dark and funny at the same time and those are books like um High Wind in Jamaica, Catch 22, um God, I'm going to go blank on all the dark, funny books I've really liked in my life. Well, even the Hilary Mantel books that I've been reading. I mean, I read The Mirror and the Light this summer, and it was the greatest joy of my life. I sobbed for about a week when uh, Thomas Cromwell was uh, executed. Spoiler. Um, but she's fantastically funny, and her characters are funny, you know, in a really kind of dark and subtle way um, and to me that's kind of the height of of what life is about and it's why I love living in England as well because I always think of England as quite a dark and funny place people have a wonderful sense of humor but they joke about about things that in America you wouldn't joke about you know things like failure and death and um, uh, yeah, failure and death. I mean, that's enough, isn't it? That's about as dark as you can get. War, well, war. But then the great novel, you know, Joseph Heller, Catch-22. Um, uh, a Golden Hill, that was another one. I voiced that one on people a lot. Um, but, yeah, is everybody reading? Is everyone reading a lot during lockdown? I'm reading more than I've read in absolute years. And pretty much heavenly because um, there's so few distractions and I hate box sets because I always feel a bit dirty after after watching a box set. Um, I've been watching um, 1930s movies, you know, sort of bringing up Baby and uh, The Thin Man and stuff like that, movies I've never seen before. So probably my next book will be set in New York. Um, uh, or where Hollywood may be in, in the 1930s, but then I'd have to do a lot of research. I'm not that good at research. Um, yeah, what else? My doggies are here. I write a lot about dogs. They're both sleeping over there, wondering why I'm sitting in the corner talking to myself on the floor. Um, I write about dogs and animals. The, the, the famous one, my favorite animal I've ever written about was the Eck in There Is No Dog. And that was a little extinct kind of anteater sort of creature. And I quite like animals because they have a sort of innocence and can express things that would sound funny coming out of the mouths of, of humans or adults or whoever would say them. So the Eck is going to be eaten. He's the last of his um, of his species, and he's going to be eaten. He's the last of his species because their their flesh is so delicious. Um, he talks about how sad it is to die that way, to be to be somebody's meal, but also to know that you're that to know that you're going to die. <clears throat> and I do remember sitting with a friend of mine on a hill in Wales and hearing all these sheep bawling loudly in the valley. And I said, um, I said, I said, I wonder what they're talking about. And um, she said, well, their babies have probably been taken away because it was sort of lamb chop season. And I said, oh God, that's awful. What, you know, at least they don't know that their babies are going to be turned into lamb chops. And my friend said, how do you know? So I've been thinking about that one ever since. Oh, Marilyn, what about a pony book? Uh, someday I'll do it. 
I mean, you know, the thing is, I'm still friends with K.M. Payton, who wrote the very best pony books ever. No, my sister, the serial killer. I should read that one. Is it really good, Sarah? <laughs> you're gonna, um, you're obviously gonna say yes. I think. Um, uh, pony books. I haven't figured out how to do the pony book yet. I think because the pony book I want to read has um, ha have all been written uh, probably back in the in the sixties. Um, but who knows? There's still time. Uh, do I agree with Twain, Tony? The more I know about people, the more I like my dog. I don't know. I I think I'm unusual in that I'm critical of my dogs. I've got two lurchers and um, I love them absolutely passionately. And they love me too. And they follow me around all over the place. But the little one um, is a lunatic. I mean, she's really a nutcase. And um, the big one is a murderer and he likes to kill foxes and cats and uh, anything he can get his hands on. So, you know, there are all those groups on Facebook where you go on and everybody says, oh, Bedlington Whippets are the finest dogs in the world. And I go, yeah, but does, doesn't your mur doesn't yours murder things? And they go, oh, well, yes, but only a little murder now and again. Um, I've had a note, somebody asking me about the audio book. Thank you, B. I would have forgotten about that. Uh, yeah, we've got Andrew Scott, the sexy priest, and Moriarty um, reading the audio book of The Great Garden. And um, my editor sent me some excerpts of it, but you know how movie actors always say, oh, I, couldn't, I couldn't watch the film. I just can't stand watching myself. And you always think, oh God, what a prima donna. Um, I, can't, I can't listen to it, which is awful because I love his voice and I love him so much. But the minute I hear him reading my words, I think, oh God, they're no, don't, they're no, I don't want to hear them. So, but my daughter says that, my daughter said it's very, very, it's very, very good. And there's a great line in it, in the book, where one, um, one of the guys is an actor and he says he cheats uh, at cards because he's studying the criminal mind because someday he might be asked to play Moriarty. So I want to hear um, Andrew Scott say, I'm, I'm going to try to do it now, but I can't do accents at all. Mori Mori Moriarty. No, I can't do it. Moriarty. Uh, no, I can't do it. Forget it. Forget I did that. Um, but um, Andrew Scott says Moriarty in really kind of the nicest way. And he's also so sexy. I mean, yeah, he's the perfect reader for this book. So, um, yeah. So you gotta buy the audio book. No, buy the real book. I think reading is good for your brain. Um, and I think probably we're getting up towards towards the hour. I mean, uh, I'm getting sick of the sound of my own voice. Maybe you guys are out there, but I have no evidence for it, except for a few little um, emails here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, maybe I should really kind of go. But uh, here, I'm going to show you the book one more time, and I'm going to show you what a beautiful production job my... My publisher did look at yellow sprayed and then end papers. How nice is that? Can you see that? Whoops, whoop, wrong way, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Why do I even bother? I don't know. I'm gonna check into an old people's home soon and just give it all up. No, wish me luck on the new book. Uh, it does have a it does have a tentative title. It's called um, Friends Like These. But I think that sounds a bit like an 80s sitcom, so it may not stick. And if everything goes well, there'll be two more summer books um, uh, to come along. Oh, wait, we have one more question at the very last minute. Do you always have lots of ideas for the next book, or do you struggle for the next idea? Mostly I struggle. And I wouldn't even call it struggling. I'd almost call it waiting. Um, um, I'll tell you one last anecdote, because it's so kind of... It's such writer's magic. I'd gone two years and I didn't have, um, oh yeah, buy a signed book with a free tote book from 
at home with and from your local independent bookseller, for God's sakes, make sure they don't go out of business. Oh, dear. Anyway, last anecdote. So two years, no book. My um, editor was bugging me and saying, well, how's the book going? How's the book going? And I kept saying, oh, it's going really well. Yeah, it's really going fine. But there was no book. Um, and I could tell she stopped believing me. So I was blogging in those days and I wrote a blog about how difficult it is to name characters. And and I said in the character in my new book, she's called, um, oh God, what was her name? Um, uh, Mila. And, you know, it's sort of set the tone um, of the book. And uh, is that shut her up? Because she thought, oh, well, if the character has a name, there's got to be a book. But there wasn't a book. And one day I was walking on the heath in uh, Hampstead and a little dog came running up to me and I said, oh dear, you're lost. And I looked at the name on its collar, on its tag, and the name was Mila. And after two years, I went home and I had the whole book in my head. And I've told that story a few times and I always say, it's not that I believe in a God of writing, but you know, something weird happens when you think a lot. Oh, somebody says, do you want to do a reading? Oh, well, does anybody want to stick around and hear it? I'll read a tiny bit. Maybe I'll just open it random. Ah, uh, here we go. Oh, this is a good scene. <clears throat> oh God, here we go. If anybody's still here. Uh, so this is our unnamed, ungendered uh, character. And he or she is working at the shop up the road from the beach. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I'd only been working in the shop a few days when Kit, Kit is the sex god, made his first appearance, wobbling up on Mal's ancient bike to get a packet of rice and some lemons for Hope. So this is your office, he said. Try to imagine that I'm Andrew Scott, okay? I was at a distinct disadvantage, sprawled on the floor with my date gun, marking down yesterday's baked goods. I felt momentarily sick with surprise. My hands shook, and I was relieved when he turned his attention to Lynn, who was eyeing him while pretending to stack egg cartons. Could you please direct me to the rice? He had on his good boy voice, without the suggestive undertones. I scrambled to my feet, knowing that crumpled and foreshortened wasn't my best look. I'll show you, Lynn said, which was not her usual policy, and led him to a shelf from which she pulled a plastic pouch of instant cooked rice and handed it to him with a pleasant expression, which was also not her usual policy. After he paid, he appeared by my side. I have new respect for your career prospects, he whispered very close to my ear. Yeah, right, I said, trembling a little despite myself. No, really, he said, his lips almost touching my ear. There's something about this whole setup that's strangely arousing. Just bugger off, I said, but he was alway, already halfway out the door grinning. Lynn and Denise tried to be casual, but they knew he was Florence Garden's son. And besides, you don't have to be a movie star's son around here if you look that good. So what's he like, they asked. And I didn't say he was a mind fuck who haunted my dreams. I just kind of shrugged and said, he's okay, which didn't satisfy them almost as much as it didn't satisfy me. So we'll leave it at that. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Go to your local uh, independent bookshop and either buy my book or buy somebody's book. I don't think it matters whose book you buy, but it's locked down and you should be reading tons and tons of books. Um, and a huge thank you again to Booker Bookshop and Bookish and Forum Books and Lingham's and to everybody um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, coming along and for asking me to be, um, oh yeah, now I'm just going to dissolve into sort of endless drivel. So I'm going to end the live video, but thank you all for coming and, um, and I hope you like the book. Bye. Oh, here we go.